And, and the name of this project is called Maestri. It's called Maestri. This is um, taking some liberties with this, with the term. Of course, it's not history. And because anyway, history is a public account. And history is a public account of change. I mean, it's an attempt to thanks, attempt to account for change in the collective and public level over a long period of time. For example, how did we get from the Middle Ages to the Enlightenment or something like that. And then there's history, which comes in between. And history is a very liberating account of, of change, uh, which, uh, as all of you know, Professor Strauss was here, is the way in which feminists make some account for the changes which have brought women into the forefront of the intellectual world and the cultural world. And then there's something called maestri, which is my own Invention. I intend for this to become nationally and internationally a prominent genre. It shall become the genre of the postmodernized university, and y'all will be the first to practice it, because I find persuasive at all today. And uh, the my is a bit, it's a problematic term. The my is uh, related to, of course, it's mine, it's also yours. It's related to the my in mycology, which is the science of mushrooms. It's the my in microphone having to do with electronic apparatus. It is the my in Mike, as you may know, Mike was the name of the first atom bomb uh, project, first experiment. So it's, it's rather uh, a number of my's in there, not to be confused with just mine. And uh, so I'm going to be talking about this genre of the new academic discourse called maestri in hopes that you will become my historiographers and make one of these things for your class project so that I can see what one looks like. <laughs> but anyway, my job as a theorist is to invent the thing. You see, and I need not make one myself, although actually I have made one, and I'll say something about that. And you have an example of one that I think uh, isn't exactly a maestri, and the reason I say it is because it was made by someone else uh, before me. And so it's not quite fine. But the, the Robert Smithson uh, piece that you looked at, the tour, the tour of the monuments of Passaic, New Jersey, uh, is, is an example of a text that I think gives us a lot of hints and clues about what a maestri might be like. And so I, wanna, I do want to talk about that a little bit. And, and I want to talk about it in the context of, uh, of the genre of explanation. I think it's important for me to say something about what constitutes an explanation not take for granted the fact that, that as I sit here and explain to you a maestri, that the explanation itself is somehow transparent and without any uh, modification, without any distortion, that I can communicate to you directly what a maestri is. So, so in order to free you from any illusions about this direct uh, transmission of the maestri, I have to say that explanations are, of course, about their subject matter, in this case, the subject matter of this explanation is how to make a maestri. But unfortunately, it's very difficult to talk about maestries uh, explicitly. It's very difficult to just say in so many words and give you uh, exact directions for making a maestri, since I have to confess I'm not exactly sure what one is. But what I do know is that at the end of this session today, you will have an idea about what it is, but it may not coincide with mine exactly. Now, the reason why I've started to try to teach in a way that what I say doesn't coincide exactly with what you come up thinking is because I found this to be the case in any, uh, in any event, that the students never seem to be able to reproduce exactly on exams and papers what I say. And I've decided that perhaps this tells me something about the nature of educational communication so that perhaps I should stop trying to communicate things to you directly and communicate with you in a rather looser sort of way, in a more indirect way, so that uh, whatever you come up with at the end uh, is, is good and is proper and, and what it should be. So I'll preface my remarks about this uh, maestri by uh, telling you about uh, why I became a teacher. And I can't tell you about this exactly directly either. It has to do with, uh, with some stories, uh, I think, uh, that, that, that tell why I perhaps got into the vein of wanting to explain things to people. I mean, I love to explain things to people. 
And so uh, why do I like to explain things to people? Well, it, it perhaps begins the day, this would have been in Miles City, Montana, uh, oh, good heavens, well, sometime in the 50s, I suppose, and uh, late 50s. Uh, the, uh, my father came out of this root cellar at the Miles City sand and gravel plant holding this tiny, wretched-looking black puppy. And his yard dog at the sand and gravel plant, which is down by the Yellowstone River, had gone into this root cellar, uh, very dank, very, I mean, you went in there and it was like inhaling pure earth. It was uh, very dank, very earthy in there. And uh, I don't know why it was there, but in any case, it was this root cellar. The yard dog had gone and had puppies. And all the puppies then had been, uh, once discovered, had been, the yard dog had not had permission to have these puppies. And uh, all the puppies had been either given away or drowned, this being not, not a very sentimental place. It was a sand and gravel plant. And, uh, and then he came up out of this root cellar with this uh, little puppy. And it had, it had survived both the giving away and the drowning and had managed to stay on because it had crawled away and hidden itself in a, a very dark corner of this root cellar and then was only discovered well, the mother knew it was there, apparently, and, and one of the workmen had discovered it. And it seemed that this dog uh, knew, it turned out, that uh, it should hide itself because uh, it turned out to be one of the ugliest creatures ever uh, to have uh, appeared in the face of the earth, at least uh, in the premises of Mile City, Montana. So we kept the dog anyway, and Dad decided to keep the dog, and we named it Hyder. And, uh, Hyder, when Hyder grew up, which happened very quickly, apparently uh, the yard dog had mated with, with rather an atrocious beast, perhaps not even, <laughs> not even uh, perhaps from outer space. It, 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 it was, it, but it had, had some wire hair terrier, I think, in it, uh, if you've ever seen it, because the hair, it looked like a steel brush that you would, you would clean, uh, you know, perhaps rust off of a, uh, you know, some sort of bituminous coal digging machine or something. It was horribly, uh, and sticky out all over, sort of like Bill the cat uh, having stuck, been stuck into an electric plug or something, the hair, you know. Uh, and it grew to be quite large and had massive shoulders and a head that sort of hung very low, at the, very low. The brain pan must have been, been quite, quite modest. And, uh, and it was very ugly, and it seemed to know that, that, that it was, was very ugly. And it stayed clear of most people. It lived under the trucks. And, uh, and the thing is, as it grew, it became much larger. It started off quite, quite small. And, uh, and as it grew, of course, uh, it, it couldn't walk into the trucks without scraping the bottom of the trucks, and it got a huge amount of grease on its back. Uh, it had this huge stripe of grease and oil uh, all down its back, uh, and it wouldn't seem to duck, you see, as it went under the trucks. It just assumed it was still small enough to go under there. Uh, it had been when it started. And, uh, and so, uh, and we couldn't seem to do anything about this. For first place, because it's very difficult to get close to Hyder. He, uh, He'd kept off about a thousand yards from everybody, and when you called him, you know, here, Hyder, he would come, but it was it was really, really shameful. He would grovel for the full thousand yards across <laughs> this this gravel pit yard was full of rocks and sand, and he would grovel just as dogs will do. Some dogs will grovel from a couple feet away. This dog would grovel from a mile and a half. He would grovel the whole way, of course, picking up stuff on its on its uh, grease, so that it just sort of became this sort of sand grease thing, and. Uh, it would grovel up to you, and of course you didn't dare hardly pet it because it was so, so filthy. And we became so ashamed of ourselves because the thing would grovel from so far away. We just became totally ashamed of ourselves. We stopped calling to it. Although, uh, but before that happened, actually the, the workman George uh, George Armstrong was his name, worked for my father, and he caught uh, Hyder one day and threw him in the river into the Yellowstone River uh, to give him a bath because uh, there was really nothing adequate to bathe him around there. Uh, we could have run to the plant, I suppose. Which have a bunch of water screening, screening the gravel. But threw him in the river, and then after that it was very difficult to get close to Hyder because no one could lay a hand on him uh, after that. He kept off 2,000 yards. And, uh, but in any case, he was around the yard a long time. He did have a big bark. He was totally, I mean, he was so grovelish that he was, of course, useless as a, as a watchdog, but people often stole gas and things from, my, from the truck sitting there. So, uh, or put sand in the gas tank also, <clears throat> as young people will do. Uh, so, but he was sort of useful, and he did chase cars along this road, this gravel road that went along there, and, and that exercised him, the sand blowing off his back. And, uh, and one morning we uh, came to work about six in the morning, and there he was, dead in the road, in this little puddle of blood. You know, he'd been hit by a 
probably a, a, a truck. And the thing that I remember about that was the look on my father's face. Just this incredible look, which is very difficult to describe. And so I have to tell another story about the other time that I saw that look on my father's face. It was, uh, and this partly also a gravel plant story, um, the, uh, this, this gravel plant, you know, we brought the stuff down from the called pit gravel, brought it down from this big gravel pit on the other side of the Yellowstone River. And uh, then it went up a big conveyor belt into this machine. There was this big machine uh, which uh, graded it. And it, was, it washed it and graded it and, then, and, uh, and into three grades and then finally into sand. You got all these piles and you're done very neatly graded. Here's the half inch rock and here's the pea gravel and here's the sand. And coming off the side were the oversized. And the oversized were basically useless. And they had this huge pile of oversized rocks and they're all sort of like this. I mean, if you could have afforded a crusher, you could have brought the crusher in and made, made smaller rocks out of it, I suppose. But, so we had this, and there, were mount, there was a mountain of these oversized rocks. And one day, uh, the, the help, the worker, George, came, came to work, and he'd been downtown in, I think it was a drugstore. And uh, he came to show my father what he had bought at the drugstore. Drug store. And you may have one of these yourself. He had found a pet rock in the drugstore. And it was this rock, just like our oversized rock. And it was in this little cardboard container. And it cost $2 for this. It had a little face paint on it, you know, sort of growl or whatever. And, and you have to know that a ton, there's a full cubic yard of these oversized rocks you could buy for $2. Right? You, could, you could have a truckload of oversized rock for $2 from my father. And George brought in this pet rock. It cost $2. And my father looked at that, and there was this look on his face, uh, which was very, very similar, I think indistinguishable from the look when um, we found Hyder uh, laying in the road. And the last time, the last time, and this is finally how I, I think why I, I can bring this together and say that this has to do with why I became a teacher, uh, was uh, I was standing there with my father, and looking out the river, and, and this guy, there's this guy named Red Cryer. And Red Cryer was the offspring of, of uh, incest, I believe. <laughs> uh, but he was seriously retarded. And probably every town has uh, one of these poor souls. And he was the village idiot. And he had, but he wasn't a complete idiot by any means. He had certain skills. He was employed in the local bowling alley. He set pins, uh, filled the coke machine. I was in there one day when, in fact, he dropped about three cases of coke. He was quite strong, but he was quite quite uh, clumsy. And he had dropped three cases of coke and broken uh, quite a bit of coke bottles. And uh, apparently this was about a month's wages for him. Uh, but in any case, he had fashioned a rototiller into a vehicle. It was, uh, it was a regular rototiller, and he had hooked up a, and he had disengaged the blade mechanism. He had this little motor. and went about two and a half miles an hour, and he had a little sort of a a wagon behind it, and he drove around town uh, on Center Road in this rototiller. And we saw, in any case, one day, so Red Cryer was going along this road where Hyder had been run over and uh, on his way out over the bridge. And it was quite a windy day. And he was on his way, I think, to the town dump, where I think he also uh, made his living to some extent, uh, and uh, picking up things there. And other trucks and cars had been going to the town dump that day. And uh, they, and something had blown off. Some a big piece of cardboard had blown off the back of a pickup truck on its way to the city dump. And so Red, on his way across the bridge, stopped his rototiller. He could hardly tell it was stopped. I mean, because it went so slow. But in any case, he stopped the rototiller and he got off. And he saw that, and he, having seen the cardboard, and he decided to throw it off the bridge to keep the street clean. And he went over to the side and he threw this large piece of cardboard. But unfortunately, he threw it into the direction that the wind was blowing. Uh, there was quite a stiff wind along the river, and it blew right back in his face. It smacked him right in the face. And rather large piece of cardboard. He staggered back, and my father and I were watching this. And so he threw it off again in the same direction. And when he did that, my father turned to me and said, there's a lesson in this. <laughs> And, and I found that ever since then, I think maybe not right away, but ever since then, I've been finding lessons in everything. I find lessons in, in almost anything. And, uh, and I like to explain uh, what they are. 
and and I think, but I, I, as I think back, I think it was trying to find out the lesson of that and uh, uh, the look on my father's face when he said that and when he saw Heider and uh, when he saw the pet rock that that has motivated me to in turn find lessons in things. So now I'm going to to tell you some of the lessons that I have found in uh, a number of things that are of interest, uh, more of interest to you, I think, and uh, beginning with. Um, this uh, Smithson piece, Passaic, New Jersey. And the Passaic, New Jersey has some elements of the genre that I want you to consider. Uh, it is, uh, and, and so I'm going to try to describe what those the generic features are. And first of all, to say that it's roughly divided into uh, four kinds of sense, four kinds of reason, four kinds of logic. And the first one is the, let's call it the register of private or personal experience. Let me get this before it turns absolutely ice cold. Better than last you time made this, Why? Uh, do you like it? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's just, but it, I recognize the, uh, the mix. It's not bad. Good. So private or personal uh, sense, uh, common sense, let's say, and and in the Passaic piece, of course, you I can't remember now exactly. I think he tells it here. He may not, but in any case, Passaic, New Jersey. Yes, I think he does say this. Is his hometown. That is, was Robert Smithson's hometown. Uh, he didn't live there all of his life, but he had, was born and, and grew up there for a while. And so, uh, and he often said in his other other writings that. Uh, that the, the landscape of New Jersey uh, saturated his unconscious, saturated his consciousness. And, uh, and so it was the place, it was the ground of, of reason. The ground of his thinking uh, was this particular landscape. And, and we have in mind uh, this hometown place as being uh, the term places in rhetoric. Is when you go looking for arguments, you find them, call them the topoi of the places. Topos is a place, an argument. And so the ground of your arguments, uh, the initial ground of a maestri, is this hometown ground, uh, Passaic, New Jersey, for Robert Smithson, uh, for example. The second level of reason in, uh, in a maestri is, and, and, and by second, I'm not, these are not in any hierarchical order, simply uh, to enumerate them or to analyze the piece. Uh, the second level, second order of reason is the disciplinary level, the level of uh, the discourse of experts, science, institutional discourse. And that's a, a high culture discourse. Now, in one respect, the high culture discourse of Passaic, New Jersey, again, I uh, have to supply uh, from other things he said, uh, Smithson considered this piece, the monuments, to be a uh, an appendix to Patterson by William Carlos Williams. William Carlos Williams was, as you know, a pediatrician, and he was Robert Smithson's baby doctor. And uh, Smithson admired enormously uh, William Carlos Williams's Patterson, which is a collage of modernist poem uh, text. And uh, so that high culture text is there uh, haunting Passaic, New Jersey. So there's, there's one a high culture piece. But more in terms of the disciplinary discourse, uh, Robert Smithson, you know, famous, well-established earth artist, I guess, would it be fair to call him an earth artist. And, uh, and so we see in the Passaic piece, a little narrative, that he picks up uh, one of the things that he, that he picks up at the newsstand as he's on his way and takes the bus, he's going to go off on a tour, uh, touring over to the side of his hometown in New York City, uh, a, a newspaper, well, that's not exactly an expert discourse, but he turns to the section of, of art reviews and he reads up on what's in the gallery. He says, to say, he checks up on his professional, on the professional discourse, he reads a review by a famous uh, critic, uh, candidate, and so forth. And, and also he picks up a book on his own field, that is to say, Earthworks, he picks up a, work, a book that is about the kind of art that he does. Those 
texts in Pasaic uh, representing his own disciplinary discourse, and he does talk something about earth art. The third level, uh, the third level of discourse, which is used in a maestri, is the level of popular culture, and in the case of of this example by Smithson, the tourist's tour, that is, the, the taking a tour, stopping, photographing, doing all of the behaviors that a tourist would do in, a, in, in popular culture, the visit to the monuments is uh, appropriated by Smithson for this account. And he does, of course, as you know, the monuments are things like the landscape of Passaic, which is an industrial landscape. Uh, the other, and what is the logic, what is the reason of this popular culture level? It is something called explanatory systems. And what Smithson uses as his explanatory system, this is the sort of thing when people say, why did you do something? Most people, if they, uh, uh, you know, uh, read are part of their culture at all, will have some sort of reason, which will be, they'll, they'll give some account of their actions based basically on popular notions of science, not expert notions. For example, Freudian notions are often used in this, uh, in our sort of an account of our behavior in everyday life, uh, not in any systematic and clinical way, but in a kind of common sense way or, or borrowing uh, certain concepts, for example, saying that our childhood uh, relationship with our parents had something to do with, with why we behave the way we do or why we make the decisions we do. This is a, a notion out of Freud that is now used commonly in explanatory system not in any uh, scientific or expert way, but just as a sort of explanatory way. Well, the explanatory system in Passaic, New Jersey, is the concept of entropy. Smithson uses the concept of entropy to, uh, to explain what's happening in Passaic, New Jersey, which is to say things are wearing down, things are running out, the second law of thermodynamics. And that uh, concept, uh, kind of popular notion of entropy uh, from physics, haunts uh, all of Smithson's work. He refers to it directly in many places. So that kind of explanatory system from uh, our popular knowledge of, uh, of how things work is the reasoning that informs the level of popular culture. Then there's one more level that I want to talk about, uh, which uh, is a little bit more difficult to convey. So I'll stimulate myself. Beyond the pleasure principle, <clears throat> making this. It's bliss sense. Bliss sense. I've stolen this word. I've, it's a it's sort of hybrid term borrowed from the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, who made this pun uh, on the term jouissance. He's talking about there's common sense, and there's uh, explanatory expert sense, and there's jouissance. There's, uh, term which means uh, bliss, it's translated, bliss. It's beyond pleasure, it's bliss. And bliss sense is the sense that is produced when you start, when you take these three levels that I've mentioned, common sense, expert sense, and explanatory popular sense, and set them moving. When you set those three levels into relationship, there is produced a bliss sense. What is that bliss sense? It has to do with uh, the crossing, the, transgress the, the transgressing of boundaries, because essentially what our culture tries to do is to keep the three levels that I've mentioned, essentially to kind of keep them apart, particularly to keep them in their place. One doesn't use common sense in an expert system, uh, and so forth. And but it turns out that from a certain point of view that I want to talk about, uh, the point of view of invention and discovery that I'll come back to, precisely discoveries and inventions are made by setting these three levels into, into motion. And what I want you to do in the maestri is discover the level of bliss sense for yourself, and only you can discover it. The other three we can all get at, and what you'll be doing is borrowing uh, the text that you make as your maestri. You'll be borrowing from these three levels just as Smithson does. You'll be using those three levels. But when you put the three levels together, the way you put them together will produce bliss sense. And the bliss sense, how do you know when you have bliss sense? 